I'm Dr. Fekri Rabari and this is Observational Studies. In this topic, we will focus on cohort studies and case control studies. Keep in mind that while cohort studies can be either prospective or retrospective, case control studies are always retrospective. Please pause this video and review these definitions. When looking at the quality of evidence hierarchy, note that Cohort studies and case control studies are lower quality compared to non-randomized control trials and randomized control trials. So observational studies in general have lower quality of evidence than experimental studies, which have lower than uh, critically appraised studies such as meta-analysis and systematic reviews. The first learning objective is interpret clinical and surrogate endpoints used in observational studies, which is the course learning outcome number four on the course syllabus. In clinical studies, when we say risk, we're really talking about probability or likelihood of an event occurring among all. Ex now, imagine we have two groups. We have uh, group A and group B, and there are 100 people in each group. So the n is 100 in each group. And imagine we're looking at the number of people who are dying. So death. And let's say 10 people died in group A and 20 people died in group B. So when we uh, talk about the risk, so the risk of death would be uh, 10 out of 100 people in group A. So 10% is the risk of death in group B and 20% is the risk of death in group B. And then we also have the concept of relative risk. So the relative risk would be the ratio of the risk. So in, if you're comparing group A to group B, it would be 10% uh, divided by 20%, which would be 50%. Now, when we look at the concept of odds, odds basically refers to the probability of a particular event occurring as opposed to the probability of that particular event not occurring. So if 10 people died here, um, you know, the remaining people are alive. So we can say how many people are in group A are alive. So that would be the remaining 90 people. And if 20 people died in group B, that means the remaining 80 people are alive. So now we can actually uh, calculate the odds of dying in each group. So in group A, the odds of dying is uh, 1 to 9. And in group B, the odds of dying is uh, 2 to 8. And of course, we can also uh, do an odds ratio. So it would be, again, the ratio of A to B. So it would be basically uh, 1 to 9 is the odds in group A. And 2 to 8 is the odds in group B, which is uh, 44%. Another example to help you uh, understand odds better is imagine you have a die that has six faces. Now, what is the probability of rolling a four on a single uh, throw? So because th there are six faces and only one four possible, the uh, probability of rolling a four would be uh, one out of six. Now, what is the probability of rolling a number other than four? So because there, there are six phases, uh, six faces and five uh, possibilities other than four, then the probability would be five out of six. Now, when it comes to odds, uh, we no longer use the number six. So the odds of rolling a four on a single throw is, you know, because there are four and five th uh, numbers that are not four, it would be uh, one to five. And if the question is, what are the odds of rolling a number other than four? So because there are five options other than four, it would be, uh, odds would be a five to one. 
Now, when interpreting the odds ratio, we kind of interpret it just like a risk ratio. So if the odds ratio is less than one, it basically means that the odds have been decreased, which typically shows benefit. And when the odds ratio is greater than one, uh, it typically means increased odds, uh, which would mean uh, increase the harm. And because we're talking about ratio, if the odds ratio is one, one would basically mean there are no difference between the groups. Now let's take a look at an example. So this is the results from a randomized trial of endoscopic sclerotherapy compared with endoscopic uh, ligation for bleeding esophageal varices. So let's just call the ligation group group A and sclerotherapy group B. As you can see in the ligation group, 18 people died and 46 people survived, which, uh, you know, adds up to 64 people in that group. And in group B, there were 65 people and 29 of them died and 36 uh, survived. So if you were to calculate the odds ratio, so first we look at the odds in group A. So we would say the odds in group A, group A uh, compared to the odds in group B. So in group A, uh, the odds of uh, death would be 18, so 18 people died to 46 people who did not die, so 46. So instead of 64, we're going to say 46 because those are the people who did not die. And then the odds in group B is uh, 29 to 36, uh, which would mean uh, 0 0.39 divided by 0.8. Uh, which is 0.49 or uh, 49%. Now, if we were to do a uh, relative risk, because risk is the probability, it's calculated a little, a little different. So in group A, it would be the risk of uh, death would be 18 out of 64 people. And then in group B, it would be 29 uh, out of 65 people. Uh, which would uh, give us 0.63 or 63%. So you see, uh, there you, you get different numbers, uh, whether you calculate relative risk or odds ratio. Now, regardless of whether there are there is odds ratio or relative risk, when it comes to number needed to treat, you have to use the risk difference. So it doesn't matter if they got relative risk or odds ratio. Regardless, you have to get the risk difference. So the risk difference here would be uh, 0 0.4. Uh, 5 5 minus uh, 0 0.28 which is uh, 0 0.165 and then the number uh, needed to treat would be uh, by the way this is uh, equivalent to 16.5 percent so then the number needed to treat is 100 divided by the absolute risk difference which is 16.5 percent which would give you uh, 6 Point zero six, which you always round up. So this is uh, seven. Now here are a few things that you should know about uh, odds ratio. So cohort studies and randomized controlled trials can either report uh, relative risk or odds ratio. Now, however, case control studies can only report odds ratio. So if you see a case control study that gives you relative risk, they've they've conducted the study inappropriately. So it should always be odds ratio. And also, when you look at regression analysis re uh, results, uh, they will also report odd, odds ratio. Now, as, as, as I showed you before, the calculation for odds and risk are different. So now let's compare the odds and the risk. So as you can see, when the risk is high, there is a big difference between odds and risk, whereas when the risk is low, the difference is small. So I've done some sample calculations for, for you here. So when um, the risk is 0 0.05, when you compared it, uh, when you convert it to odds, you can see the odds are 0 0.053, and the equation is down here. Um, you know, and this is just to show you the concept. You don't really have to do these calculations. So you can see when the risk is really small, like 0.05, it's close to the odds. As the risk increases, you can see that these numbers start to deviate from the risk. So in fact, once you go, um, you know, past 0.5, it really becomes a huge gap. So you can see this is twice as much. So a risk of 0.5 is half of the odds of 1.0. And when you go to 0.6, 1.0 is 
1.5, 0 0.8, 4.0. So what I'm really trying to show you is that the uh, the odds ratio will always make a treatment appear more effective uh, than relative risk. Another thing that you should also keep in mind is that while randomized control trials can demonstrate causation between treatment and uh, outcome, causality cannot be established in observational studies. So when you look at the results of observational studies, it can only show you association. It can never establish uh, causality, which is extremely important to keep in mind when you interpret uh, these odds ratios and relative risks. And of course, uh, you know, when it comes to statistical significance, we do the same thing with 95% confidence interval. You use a, you use a p-value to see if the odds ratio is statistically significant, or you can use the 95% confidence interval and if, as long as the inf uh, confidence interval does not include one, because one means no difference, then you can conclude that the results are statistically significant. Now let's take a look at the uh, example. So this study was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1997. So they, they basically, this is a case control study. They looked at healthcare workers with occupational percutaneous exposure to HIV infected blood. So basically people who you know, accidentally, accidentally poke themselves with an infected needle. So they want to see how many uh, people will actually develop HIV. So they, so you know, as this is a case control study, they started with the outcome. So the cases are people who had the outcome. So these are the people who actually became HIV positive, and the controls are people who did not have the outcome. So these are people who did not become HIV positive. So in this table, so again, these are your two groups. The, the case are patients who uh, developed HIV and controls are people who did not develop HIV and everybody accidentally poked themselves. So now they're looking at different, uh, they're doing multiple analysis. So the first row, they're looking at the size, at the size of the needle. And then they're doing, uh, giving you the odds ratio. So you can see um, if they poke themselves with a large needle, the odds were actually 14 and it was statistically significant. As you can see, this is, uh, f the confidence interval goes from 4.9 to 39. So it does not include one. The entire in confidence interval is to the right side of one, which is the line of no difference. And the p-value is consistent, so it's statistically significant. If after exposure, everybody receives Zydovudine, which is a HIV drug, you can see that it made no difference between the two groups. So meaning that the patients were not at increased odds of developing HIV if they received Zydovudine. So you can see the p-value is statistically significant, uh, I'm sorry, insignificant, and um, the confidence interval includes one. So this goes from 0 0.3 to 1.4. So the one is actually included in the middle of between 0.3 and 1.4.